All right, welcome to Scott Street, as I said. If you're, if you're in here in the building or if you're watching at Tabor Manor, uh, we want to welcome you here as well, uh, or at the Maple View or Evergreen Apartments, or online. Welcome with us this morning. Um, yes, as I mentioned, my first announcement is in the bulletin. Next Sunday will be Daylight Savings Time, so don't forget to turn your clocks ahead one hour. Um, there's a number of announcements in the bulletin. I just want to highlight two of them. Uh, our annual gen general meeting is coming up on the 24th of March, so mark that in your calendars. It's going to be at 6.30 p.m. It's a Saturday here in the sanctuary. Um, everyone's invited to join us, uh, specifically the members. Um, but. If you're not a member, feel free to join and f see what's going on in our church. Um, the 21 Laws of Leadership course is a go. It has, it has, we've, the dates have been picked. It's going to be starting on April 5th at 7 p.m. and running for seven weeks. So if you would still like to join, you can contact Jeff Weintz and he will get you signed up and get you a book. So, uh... Yeah, there's a number of other announcements. Uh, please read the bulletin. I'm just going to pray to open the service, and then we'll continue worshiping together. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for uh, dying on the cross to, to forgive our sins. And we pray that you would be with us this morning in this room and in this building and to those we interact with. And, uh, yeah, we pray that our worship would be pleasing to your, to your ears this morning, too. In your name we pray. Amen. Uh, hey, good morning, everyone. Hello, welcome here. Um, let me just read uh, a passage of scripture to kind of uh, get our hearts and minds in the right place for worship this morning. Um, it's the, the first part of Psalm uh, 105. It says, Give thanks to the Lord and proclaim his greatness. Let the whole world know what he has done. Sing to him, yes, sing his praises. Tell everyone about his wonderful deeds. Exalt in his holy name. Rejoice, you who worship the Lord. Search for the Lord and for his strength. Continually seek him. Remember the wonders he has performed, his miracles, and the rulings he has given. Now can we all stand together and uh, let's join our hearts first in prayer as we begin our, uh, our Sunday morning service. Uh, Father God, we thank you for this morning. Uh, I pray that uh, even now that uh, our hearts would be uh, searching for you and, and searching for your strength, God. Um, God, I pray that you would reveal to us um, in, in new and, and fresh ways, God, the, the fullness of the love that you have for us, uh, your children. God, I, I thank you that you prepare our hearts, God, that you prepare us for these moments um, in ways that we might not understand. But, you know, I pray that uh, the music that we sing this morning, um, the, the message that we hear, God, I pray that uh, in, in a very real way that, that there will be things in this morning service that connect you to each one of us, God, that, that we would all in, in, in some way grow closer to you this morning. God, and that we would know you better. Um, I thank you for uh, this place, and I, I thank you for um, the grace that you've extended to us to allow us to, to be here and to worship you um, in, a, in freedom. Uh, in Christ's name we pray. Amen. of 
again. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. You may be seated. Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your mighty love. My comfort, my shelter, tower. God, I, I just pray that that is um, the, the cry of, of our heart as a, as a collective, as a body this morning. God, that we would just be uh, just shouting your praise. God, that, our, that our, from, from our hearts would just uh, flow um, just an overwhelming sense of, of your power and, and just wanting to praise that. 
wanting to sing about that. Um, and I pray that uh, as we take this morning's offering, God, that you would um, also uh, give us peace in our hearts to be able to uh, give what it is that you've uh, called us to give. In Christ's name, amen.
time for Kid Zone. If all the kids can come meet me up here at the front. So we started a new unit last week, and there's something that there's a special word that we learned last week. Something that we're going to be learning about this unit. Does anyone remember the special word we learned? Chris, will remember that it starts with a P. The stories that Jesus would tell. What were they called? It starts with a P. Parables? Yes, they're called parables. Good job remembering. <laughs> so we're going to hear another parable today. And the parable today is going to be about forgiveness. It's a very big topic. Who here has ever had to forgive someone? Raise your hand. Oh, some of you. You guys have had an easy life so far. <laughs> You've never had to forgive anyone. Have you ever had to ask for forgiveness from someone? Some of you? Oh, we got perfect angel children up here. <laughs> that is impossible. Okay, well, I have a few um, scenarios here. There's three of them, so I want you to listen to them. They're all things that need forgiveness. And I want you to think, which one would be the hardest for you to forgive? Okay, ready? You can also participate in this. Number one, your classmate didn't invite you to their birthday party and everyone else got invited, all of your other friends. Number two, your brother borrowed your brand new favorite video game and he broke it. <laughs> Number three, your grandpa was supposed to take you to the movies and he forgot. <laughs> Ruben laughed at that one. <laughs> Okay, so out of those three, I'm going to read them one more time. And which one you think is the hardest, you raise your hand. Which would be the hardest to forgive, okay? Number one, your classmate didn't invite you to their birthday party. Raise your hand if you think that's the hardest. A couple of you. Number two, your brother borrowed and broke your new video game. That's, oh, that's a serious one. Mm-hmm. And number three... Your grandpa forgot to take you to the movies. Who thinks that would be the hardest? Nate, your, your hand is down. No one thinks that would be the hardest? No? Oh, okay. So, <laughs> so I guess video games, now we know where our priorities lie. Video games, that's a hard one. So there are things that happen in our life that sometimes people hurt us. Sometimes they mean to. Sometimes it's by accident. But... It can be very hard to forgive people, right? Would you like to say something? Uh, we got a new game uh, about fishing on our iPad, and if a brother br broke it or glitched it or something like that, me and Ruben would probably get really angry. Well, it's a good thing that you're coming to our lesson today then, because we are going to learn about how to forgive people. Have we had to be forgiven before? Have we made mistakes? Yes. And we're going to learn that God has forgiven us a great, great debt, something that we can never repay, right? All of our sin in our life, God has forgiven us for that. And so when someone makes a mistake or sins against us, we need to remember that God has already forgiven us, and we want to show that same kind of forgiveness to those that hurt us, right? So we're going to go downstairs, and we're going to learn a little more about that this morning. So we're going to pray. We've been talking a lot about prayer downstairs. Does anyone think that they would want to pray for us this morning? Would anyone be brave enough? Macy, would you like to? Awesome. Thank you. Dear Lord, I hope we have a great day tomorrow, and I hope we have a fun time downstairs, and I hope everybody has a great time, and I hope 
everybody um, has a great day, and I hope um, everybody um, 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 has a great time downstairs, and um, and I hope we have a great time. Amen. So um, I encourage you to take out your prayer and praise uh, insert. And throughout the week, uh, yeah, please go through this, and when you're praying this week, uh, uh, make sure to remember these things in prayer and these people. Um, and as a note, Josh and Natasha, who we've added to the list serving at Camp Crossroads, are actually here this morning, so feel free to say hi and that you're praying for them serving there. Uh, there is one item that isn't on the, on the list, so if you have a pen, feel free to add it to the back. Um, our friend Linda Gray's son has had a heart attack. Uh, he's 44, but he's recovering right now, so we want to pray for a speedy recovery for him. Um, join with me in prayer. Mm -hmm. Heavenly Father, we thank you for um, your faithfulness and for your love for us. We pray that you would be with everyone who is in our congregation or connected to us who is struggling with health issues. Uh, we pray specifically for... Yeah, for Linda Gray's son and for Pam Burness's stepfather, we pray that you would um, be with them as, um, as they're recovering or they're going through treatments. Um, we want to pray for those who are confined to their homes and those who are struggling with health issues. Um, you know all their names. We pray for them every week. We want you to be with each and every one of them and um, that you would love them, heal them, and um, that they would feel... Uh, your presence through the friends and family as we as we gather around them and, and pray and love them. Um, yes, we pray for Josh and Natasha, part of our part of our congregation who are serving up north. We pray that you would work through them, work through Camp Crossroads. Um, it's approaching the summertime. We pray that you would be with each of the kids that are going to be going up this summer and the families, um, and just work there this summer. Um, we pray for ourselves uh, as we are continuing the search for a lead pastor. We pray that you would put it on someone's heart who, who needs to be here for this. We pray that you would bring the right person and that we would, um, yeah, we would as a church be able to uh, continue to move forward to uh, do your work here in St. Catharines. And yeah, we want to pray specifically for uh, Rodney and Tim and David as, as they, they lead our congregation in, in their own ways, um, whatever they are specifically. We pray that you would give them wisdom, give them uh, strength and patience as they, uh, as they do your work here too. Um, and we want to continue to remember those who have recently lost loved ones. Um, and we pray that you would comfort them, that you would um, yeah, be, be their father, be their friend, and that we would be able to uh, surround them in your love as well. And yeah, in all these things, we, we thank you and we praise you and we um, trust that you are able and willing to, to heal and to provide the support that, um, that they need right now. In your name we pray, amen. Good morning. Scripture this morning is taken from the book of Exodus, chapter 3, uh, verses 1 to 15. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within the bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. 
When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, Here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in, in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are opp oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you, and this, is, this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, What is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name you shall call me from generation to generation. Um, two weeks ago, we started a new sermon series, and for the next while, we'll be working our way through the book of Exodus, looking at the way that God worked in and through his people, bringing them out of slavery in Egypt, journeying with them in the desert as they learned to know and trust their God again, learning how to fully be his people, and ultimately become a people whom God could dwell in and amongst. This is an old, old story. And yet when we take a closer look, there are so many lessons that we can learn and apply to our own lives, because still thousands of years later, God desires to journey with, dwell amongst, and work in and through his people, us, Paul tells the church in Ephesus that in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. This is God's word to us today as well, that as we work on this important task that God has given to us of being a family, brothers and sisters in Christ, God's children, the church, a body who works and loves each other. As we love God wholly and completely with every part of our being, making him the one true Lord of our lives, and as we love others, recognizing that God's hope is for all of his creation to come into relationship with him, that every person that we meet was knit together in their mother's womb and is loved by God. And as we have the opportunity and calling to share God's love with them. As we work on this, we are being built together to become a dwelling place in which God lives by his spirit. We do these things not as tasks to check off out of obligation and duty, but we do these things because we have experienced the transforming love and power of God in our lives and as we live in his presence, his love compels us to love others and draw them into his love. For Israel, it was a long and hard journey to becoming a people whom God could dwell among, a journey marked with mighty triumphs and tragic failures. And we are not new to this journey. We aren't at the beginning of our own little story as a church, we're celebrating 75 years of life as a church family this year. 
But it's also important for us to remember and recognize that we're actually part of God's big story. We are a continuation of the story started so long ago that will continue on into eternity. We have had and will continue to have our own moments of mighty triumph and tragic failure. But as we look back at God's story and movements in the book of Exodus, as we look at how God worked in and through his people in the past, we can be reminded of the powerful truths that can serve as encouragement, spurring us on in our part of this great story. Uh, in my own life, I'm not consistently an active journaler, um, but there have been times in my life when I've consistently taken time to write out scripture passages that have been meaningful, daily experiences that I've had with God, or things that he's saying to me, interactions I've had, and things that I've learned. Um, is anybody here a, a dedicated journaler? Does anybody keep journals? Not really, hey? Okay, a few. We've got a few. That's good. So um, maybe you've had this same experience if you, if you are a journaler. Uh, every few years as I'm cleaning out and reorganizing my closets, I come across these old journals. And when I have a chance, I take time to read through them. Um, and as I do this, I find it super impactful to read through them and be reminded of the lessons that I've learned, often things that I've long forgotten, um, and to see the way that God was speaking to me and the things that he was working on with me. In Isaiah 64, verse 8, we read, You, Lord, are our Father. We are the clay. You are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. And at least for me, looking back at the way that God has worked in my life is such a great reminder that my hope and my prayer is for God to always be shaping and molding me into his image and the necessity for me to always be a work in progress, continually being molded further and further into God's image and to also not allow myself to shift back into my old ways and have to relearn the lessons that I've already learned. So similar to looking back at old journals in our own personal journey, remembering and learning again from God's movements and works in our own lives, we are part of God's big story. So what we read in Scripture is our backstory. And looking back at God's movements in Scripture helps us remember how God has worked in the past and it reminds us to hold on to those lessons and promises and truths that have been given. So with that in mind, let's pick up where we left off last time. If you remember, two weeks ago, we saw that God had done a mighty miracle. What had started in Genesis as a promise made to a childless couple that was a long time in coming has now come to fruition. God had promised Abraham and Sarah that their descendants would be as numerous as the stars in the sky and the dust on the earth. And Exodus opens by showing us that this has come true. The Israelites were exceedingly fruitful. They multiplied greatly, increased in numbers, and became so numerous that the land was filled with them. However, in the midst of this miracle, life is hard. Like, really hard for the Hebrews in Egypt. Their slaves being worked ruthlessly by the Egyptians. And then to make matters worse, Pharaoh enacts genocide on them by declaring that all baby boys are to be killed. Although God seems to be nowhere in sight, we saw that he was indeed working behind the scenes through the courageous and faithful actions of some very unlikely people. Five women whose actions defied the very real demands of the world that they lived in and through which we can see God putting things in place to make a big move. And now we see that the baby boy who had been saved has grown up. So we're going to do a lot of, of scripture reading and it will be up there, but feel free to open your, your Bibles and read along as well. So Exodus 2 verse 11 is where we'll start. One day, after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were and watched them at their hard labor. 
He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. Looking this way and that and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. The next day he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the one in the wrong, Why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? The man said, Who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, What I did must have become known. When Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian, where he sat down by a well. Now a priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came to draw water and fill the troughs to water their father's flock. Some shepherds came along and drove them away, but Moses came up, got up and came to their rescue and watered their flock. When the girls returned to Ruel, their father, he asked them, Why have you returned so early today? They answered, An Egyptian rescued us from the shepherds. He even drew water for us and watered the flock. And where is he? Ruel asked his daughters. Why did you leave him? Invite him to have something to eat. So Moses agreed to stay with the man who gave his daughter Zipporah to Moses in mar- marriage. Z- Zipporah gave birth to a son, and Moses named him Gershom, saying, I have become a foreigner in a foreign land. <clears throat> While all the other boys his age were murdered, Moses survived. We don't actually know how much he knew about where he came from and who he was, but it's clear that he did know about his Hebrew lineage. He was a Hebrew, and yet he grew up as an Egyptian prince with every advantage and privilege. And while his own people suffered under oppression and slavery, he was getting an education and understanding of how Egypt and Pharaoh function. And there seems to be this inner struggle at work in Moses as he figures out who he is and his place in this world. When in Egypt, he isn't recognized as a Hebrew, and yet even with all of the privilege that he experienced, he doesn't seem to be fully recognized as an Egyptian either. Who is he and where does he belong? Interestingly enough, when he's in the desert, the women he assisted recognize him and label him as an Egyptian. And we can see this inner battle of trying to find identity when he names his firstborn son Gershom, saying, I have been an alien residing in a foreign land. We see that he has this sensitivity to injustice in the world around him. We see this in both his intervention when he sees one of his own people being beaten and when he steps up to help the women in the desert being mistreated by the shepherds. In each of these interactions, Moses could have sided with the stronger party, the Egyptians and the male shepherds, yet he chooses to accept danger by siding with the weak because he sees this injustice and is compelled to intercede. In the interaction that he has with the slaves and the Egyptian, it's clear that his intentions are right, but his actions are not, and they cause further danger and turmoil in his life. Um, When I think of Moses, I often think of the great and mighty leader that he became. I think of the end result. But here we see the circumstances that went into shaping and forming him. We see the very real and confused attempts of a man trying to figure out his place in this world. In Richard Foster's study Bible, he comments that God takes a convoluted path in raising up a leader to help save his people. And God chooses this convoluted path to shape the soul and destiny of Moses. So we shouldn't be surprised if God chooses this indirect and convoluted path to shape our own souls and destinies as well. Last week, Rudy Dirks shared with us five postures that God calls us to take at various points and stages of our lives. Um, Some of these, yeah, so their engagement, acceptance, release, failure, and rest. And some of these postures are easier and more natural for us because they're postures in which we're thriving and living into our strengths and growing and seeing good things happen in our lives. But there are other seasons and postures that God calls us to and that God uses in our lives that are so much harder for us to live in. So much harder for us to accept, and yet these postures are essential 
for us to take as we follow God to mold and shape us, building us up for his purpose. Here we see that Moses is in that hard place of struggle. And we also see that God is at work, not yet in an obvious way that's discernible to those in the midst of the story, the ones living it out. But if we, as repeat readers who know how this story ends, think ahead to what's coming for Moses, meeting Pharaoh in the palace, courts, and demanding the release and freedom of the Hebrews, bringing God's people out of Egypt, leading them and keeping them alive in the desert for 40 years, we can see that even in Moses' searching and anguish, his Egyptian training and education, his failed attempt at bringing justice to his people, his feeling like an alien in a foreign land, living a small life in the desert, shepherding and caring for sheep, God is preparing him with specific skills and knowledge that will be essential to the task he will be called to. As hard and confusing as it's been, all of these experiences are preparing him for what lies ahead, for the good works God prepared in advance for him to do. Exodus 2, verse 23, we'll read on. Um, During that long period, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out, And their cry for help, because of their slavery, went up to God. God heard their groaning, and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. Um, Have you ever in your own life felt that in your struggle and anguish and heartache, that God has perhaps forgotten you? Here at the end of Exodus 2, we read that God hears and remembers his promise, the covenant he made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God looks at them and sees the state that they're in and is concerned about them. But does this mean that God didn't know what was going on? Or that he didn't care about it? Maybe he was too busy being the God of the universe and dealing with situations going on elsewhere. (laughs) It's important for us to remember that this is written from a human perspective. God was working out their salvation long before they even knew enough to cry out for it. While they were toiling away at their slavery in silent, hopeless despair, God was preparing their deliverer. God had not been idle and their need for salvation. Even though they didn't even have the hope, hope enough to cry out for it, their need for salvation was being taken care of. And when they did cry out, God had a Savior ready to be brought onto the scene. God knew what they needed. In the God-remembered language, the narrator is giving us two perspectives. We see that from the limited inside perspective of the Hebrews, it really does seem that God has forgotten them and that they have to cry out to be remembered. But from the outside perspective that we have, it's clear that God remembered before Israel even thought to reach out for him. God sees, and he hears, and he knows about what is happening. And he has been at work all along to bring about change. And that's a great reminder for us that God sees us, he hears us, and he knows what's going on in our lives. He isn't far away and uncaring, but it's us who have a hard time seeing him and hearing him and knowing him. When Jesus spoke to the crowds and taught them about who God was and how he worked, Jesus always ended his stories and teaching by saying, whoever has ears, let them hear. I pray often that we as a congregation, as a family, would have ears to hear that we wouldn't be blind to what God is doing and deaf to what he's saying, but that we would be able to discern his movements clearly, that we would see not only the big, visible, miraculous movements of God, but that we'd also trust and know that in the ordinary bits of life, even the hard ones, that God is at work, that he cares and is actively seeing, listening, and aware of what is going on, and that he's at work bringing about his plans. 
God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. The next section of the story was already read to us this morning by Trish, so I won't read it again now, but um, speaking of ears to hear and eyes to see, what I love about this holy and awe-inspiring interaction that Moses has with God is that it seems as though, had Moses not had eyes to see and ears to hear, this interaction may very well have never happened. (laughs) Um, Exodus 3, verse 2 to 4 says, There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in the flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though, that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, hmm, I'll go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the fire, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Um, And again, I mean, this is written from a, a human perspective, but I mean, it seems like there are a few different choices. He sees this and then he thinks, hmm. I'm going to go over there and see what this is about. What would this story have looked like had he not chosen that? The story and interaction is one that I read as a child and was immediately fascinated by it. You can feel the holiness and heaviness of the moment and the very real and tangible presence of God. And this is something that I've longed for and prayed for. But when you look at the details of it, even in the holiness, it is still so human. (laughs) I have a board in my office on which I've posted a few quotes that I've come across over the years. And one of them is a section of a poem um, by Elizabeth Barrett Browning that says, Earth is crammed with heaven, and every common bush aflame with God. And only he who sees takes off his shoes. The rest sit around it and pluck blackberries. Moses is going about his regular day. I'm sure he woke up that morning like he did every morning, washed the sleep out of his eyes, had breakfast with his family, kissed his wife and kids goodbye, and headed out the door to go and tend for his father's, father-in-law's flock of sheep. He had no idea that this day would end drastically different than every other day in the past 40 years of his life since he had settled in Midian. But he had eyes that saw something out of the ordinary that day, and he thought to himself that he would go and take a closer look. I hope and pray that I'm aware of God's presence and movements around me in the ordinary moments of my days, and that I recognize and enter into his holy presence when I'm called. God calls and welcomes Moses into his holy presence and explains to him that he's seen the misery of his people. He's heard their cries, he knows about their suffering, and he's come to rescue them and fulfill the second part of that promise he made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He will bring them into their own land. And God says to Moses, go, I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. And how does Moses respond? He begins a negotiation with God, trying to get out of what God is asking him to do. And for a long time in my life, I read this story and shook my head, thinking, seriously, Moses, you're standing on holy ground in the presence of God, and you dare to question and try to weasel your way out of what he's asking of you? Seriously, man, step up. But when I think of my own life and experiences, when God has called me to step up to a task that seems too big and beyond what I'm capable of, totally out of my comfort zone, I can't honestly say that I've responded any differently. And I know from conversations that I've had with many of you that this is your story as well. God has a funny way of calling us into things and ministries and tasks that feel too big for us. But maybe that's the point. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 26 to 31, Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God, 
That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. God has given each one of us gifts and talents, and he's asked us to use those to build his kingdom. Maybe none of us will have a great calling like Moses, but each one of us has something that God has entrusted to us. And whether that's a great or small calling, step up. Don't hide what God has given to you, but trust that God will be faithful as you use the gifts and step into the calling that he's given to you. Moses' first pushback to God is, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He questions his ability and his credentials. And if you remember back in Exodus 2, when Moses tried to step in and mediate the argument between the two Hebrews, they asked a similar question of him. Who made you ruler and judge over us? Self-doubt and fear and the opinions of others are so quick to make us step back from what God is asking of us. But God reassures Moses that he will be with him. Moses, at the end of the day, this isn't about you. It's about me, and my presence is with you. That is the reason that you should go. I'm the one making you the leader of my people. To that, Moses responds by saying, okay, but who are you? The Hebrews had spent 400 years in Egypt, and we see evidence of God's hand in Moses' life right from the beginning. But remember that he grew up in the Egyptian palace, learning from Egyptian teachers about Egyptian gods. He knew that he was a Hebrew and that his god was the god of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But it's clear that he doesn't actually know this god of his. And here God explains who he is with a richness and a fullness that hasn't yet been seen in scripture. I am who I am. Yahweh, Jehovah. Richard Foster explains that this name points to God as the one who creates and sustains the world and who acts powerfully in it with loving purpose. Two powerful themes throughout the Old Testament. This is the God who is mover and shaker, the one who makes things happen. The God who sends Moses is the God who acts. What better God to announce to Hebrew slaves who long for deliverance? What better God to rely on in our own longings. Moses' negotiation with God goes on. He pushes back five times on this, and I love that God answers him back each time. The highs, you know, in all truth, it's clear to us that everything in Moses' life was leading up to this moment. The highs of him being saved when others were killed to the lows of his failures in the past were all to prepare him for this calling. But Moses doesn't see that, and he questions the calling God is giving to him over and over, finally ending with a desperate plea for God to please just send someone else. And God hears his questions and concerns and doubts, and God gives him reassurances every time, verbal promises and explanations, future signs to look for as confirmation that he's on the right track, physical, miraculous evidence of his power, and even a partner to support him in the role he's being called to. God knows our fears, and even though they aren't necessary, because God is big enough to fulfill what he calls us to, he meets us in that place of insecurity and fear. I don't know where you're at in your life and relationship with God right now, but there's encouragement and challenge in this story for many of us. Maybe you're in that hard place of trying to figure out where you fit and belong in this world. You feel like an alien in a foreign land. Maybe you've tried stepping out the way that you think you're supposed to, but it seems to be backfiring. Maybe you've been going through a really hard time and you're crying out to God, but he doesn't seem to be listening. Maybe you see God doing something out of the corner of your eye and you're thinking about going and taking a closer look. Or maybe God has already told you what he's calling you to do, but the fears and insecurities are holding you back from going. As the team comes back up, I just want to encourage you to press into God. Whatever you're going through, know that God sees you and he hears you and he knows what you're experiencing And his presence and moving is at work around you. Cry out to him. Seek him. 
and trust that he, the great I am, is present with you. Bow with me in prayer. Yeah, Father, I I thank you that you are the creator and sustainer of this world. You aren't a God who's far away, but you're a God who's active in the midst of every part of our lives. And God, I pray again, like I've prayed so many times, that we would be the ones who have ears to hear and eyes to see, minds that, that grasp and can comprehend what you're doing. God, I pray that, that we would be faithful with the talents and the gifts and the strengths that you've given to us, with the calling that you've given to us. Um, yeah, you have prepared good works in advance for each one of us to do, for us to live into. And so, God, I pray that, that in our lives, yeah, we would hear your calling clearly, we would step up, that, that we would have faith that where you call us, you go, and that it's about you doing the work and about us following you closely. So God, I thank you for the encouragement and the challenge that we can take out of this story that happened so long ago. And God, I pray, you, you know, Holy Spirit, you know exactly where each one of us are in our lives. You know the things that... that we're insecure about you know the things that we're struggling through right now you know the the joys that we're experiencing and so holy spirit i ask that that you would yeah that we would allow you to work that we would open our hands and our hearts and our eyes and our ears and we would we would say yes to it that we would invite you into our reality and that as as we invite you in that that yeah, you would prove yourself faithful. Yeah, so I thank you that you call us. I thank you that each one of us has a calling to, to live in your presence and also to share your love with the world around us. And so, God, I pray that you would teach us what that looks like for each one of us because it's, it's different for each one of your children. So, God, I pray that you would teach us how to live into the calling that you've given to us. In your holy name I pray. Amen. Uh, Let's stand together, please, and let's sing a closing song about uh, our willingness to, to follow after Jesus wherever he may lead.
brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, and ratified an eternal covenant with his blood. May he equip you with all you need for doing his will. May he produce in you through the power of Jesus Christ every good thing that is pleasing to him. All glory to him forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace.